Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Closed captioning is provided by Mark and Margaret Yankel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm. ShalomHill.org. Fall is a beautiful time of the year when plants take on a special look as they prepare for winter. As gardeners, we have a few chores that we need to do to help some of those plants make it through the winter. Join me on Prairie Yard and Garden as we learn how to take care of our water garden plants as we put them to bed for winter. Many of us are tempting fate by growing plants out of their native range. We enjoy them all summer long, but they need special care to survive our winters. Joining me today is Bernie Angus, landscape gardener at the West Central Research and Outreach Center in Morris, to talk about getting your water garden ready for winter. Bernie, welcome to Prairie Garden Garden. Thank you, Larry. Pleasure to be here. Well, we've enjoyed this water feature all summer long, but it does take some special care in the fall. Where do you begin? Well, depending on the size of the water garden that someone might have, um, the first thing would be is to empty the water out. Uh, in this case, we have a fairly large uh, water pond uh, with a pump that circulates the water with a, a falls and such, uh, but we'll shut the pump off and then we'll use the pump to empty out the water. But if somebody had just something the uh, size of a whiskey barrel as their water garden, uh, maybe just emptying it out with an ice cream pail or if they're able to tip it over to get rid of the water. Uh, so that's our first step is to uh, re reduce the amount of water in there and then we'll start uh, working on getting the plants out. Tell me a little bit about this garden. How long has it been in place and uh, what kind of care does it take during the summertime? We approximately have had this uh, water garden here about 12, 13 years. Um, it's planted with uh, cattails around the outside edge here. This is a dwarf cattail, so it doesn't get very tall. Uh, it also has uh, marginal plants, uh, mostly tropical marginals, uh, that we will have to remove. Uh, we have water lilies in there. We have hardy water lilies, uh, which will take our cooler temperatures, but again, the tuber on those cannot freeze. So we have to take them out of the pond and put them somewhere else for winter storage. Uh, there's also tropical water lilies that we have in here. Um, those we kind of typically treat as an annual. Uh, they're difficult to overwinter those. Uh, but in the summer what we do is uh, once or twice a week uh, we have a student that will come in and remove uh, the flowers that have uh, died down from the water lilies. Uh, any of the water lily leaves that are starting to turn yellow, uh, they are removed because we do not want those to decompose in the water pond uh, because that adds nutrients. And with sunlight and nutrients, uh, we get algae that can start in the pond. So by basically what we call deadheading, uh, same as anybody would do with their annual flowers or perennials, uh, we do the same thing in a water garden. This particular water garden, how deep is it? Uh, it's only two feet deep, uh, mainly because uh, city regulations uh, if you have a pond that's deeper than two feet, you have to put a fence up around it for uh, safety reasons. And so that's the reason we only went two feet deep on this particular pond. We have a couple shelves. Uh, the outer shelf is only about six inches deep, and that's where the cattail are growing because they like it a little bit shallower, as do some of the other marginal plants. Uh, then we have a shelf that's a little bit deeper that we can put other plants, and then our water lilies are located in more of the center of the pond. And my understanding that water lilies uh, have different levels that they like. I mean, there's different varieties of water lilies. There are. Uh, for this type of pond, we have the standard water lilies. If someone has a whiskey barrel, a very small type of uh, water feature or garden, uh, there are dwarf uh, water lilies uh, for those 
type of situations that will grow in a much smaller uh, water area. Where the hardy water lilies, typically they can take up three to five feet of surface space uh, with all their leaves. Well, that'll cover the pond quickly. And, yes. And, and that has some advantages? Yes, that's a good uh, point that uh, we want at least 60% of the water surface covered with plant material, leaves, uh, annual uh, floating type of plants. So again, we're trying to prevent that sunlight from getting into the water and increasing algae production. So water lilies are a good uh, type of plant to have in a water garden to prevent uh, especially algae from growing. In addition to the water lilies that we've got in the pond, we also have some tropical plants. And those we have planted in containers. And we usually put those around the outer edge of the pond because they like uh, shallow water can't be planted too deep and they can go just planted in the stones we've got in the pond but um, I put them in containers because if you want to keep them over winter all you need to do is bring your container in uh, put some kind of a saucer underneath that you keep water in it and overwinter them that way and then next spring you can put it uh, back out into the pond but they uh, offer a little bit different texture and such uh, in your pond this happens to be a dwarf papyrus uh, doesn't get any taller than this and actually this particular one, if they wanted to next spring, they could easily cut this into probably three or four different sections and uh, multiply their number of plants that they've got. Right now the particular pond we've got here, our cattails are getting a little bit dense and probably next year I'll start thinning those out a little bit more uh, so that some of these tropicals are a little bit showier. In uh, preparing that for winter storage, you're going to put it in a black plastic bag or is it just going to sit out in the open? This particular, the tropical plants uh, like this dwarf papyrus needs to go where it's warm and get some sunshine. Uh, I put them in a basement window that I've got. Uh, if they're having it upstairs, obviously they might want to do put it in a little bit different container that would be a little nicer looking. Uh, but they'll need a saucer underneath of it and so that there's probably an inch of water sitting in that saucer. Uh, throughout the whole season through the winter. But otherwise, it'll actually make a nice house plant. But it does need to come in where it's warm, uh, probably, you know, 65, 70 degrees and giving it some sunlight. Okay. Another one that we've got is uh, a dwarf um, umbrella palm. And this one here, I think uh, the fish kind of got in and did a little digging around. It'll need a little bit more soil for next spring. But again, gives it a little bit different texture. Uh, we might want to prune off some of these uh, dead foliage for bringing it in for the winter. Uh, this can go back out again next spring in the container it's in. Or again, it could be divided apart here uh, with a sharp knife, uh, two or three different pieces if they want to share some with some friends. Uh, again, if they're having it upstairs in their home, obviously they might want to put it in a little bit nicer container. Uh, but again, having a saucer that would have about an inch of water in it, uh, sunshine and 65 or 70 degrees. Barbie would uh, require watering several times a week to uh, maintain. Depending on uh, how dry their house is, yes. Uh, I usually only have to do mine about once a week, but I usually put in maybe uh, two or three inches of water. I usually have uh, somewhat deeper uh, dishes that I set them in, so it, hopefully it lasts a week. And another one we've got, there's one right in front of you here, Larry. Uh, this is a canna uh, that we have as a water plant. Uh, now this particular one, all we need to do with him is to cut the foliage off, and let some of the excess water drain out. And I'll put him in a dark uh, garbage bag and store him where it's cooler, 45 to 50 degrees where it's dark. Uh, so he doesn't have to go into uh, uh, sunny conditions or warm conditions. I see one more over there. It's okay. maybe not a tropical. Though. This one isn't a tropical. This is a variegated cattail. It's kind of a nice addition to the pond because uh, it does have that variegation. So it's not just a solid green leaf. It's got kind of a lighter whitish cream color uh, throughout the leaf. Um, this is a hardy uh, plant. And so this one, all we would have to do is to cut this foliage off just above the pot here and uh, drain the excess water off, put that in a, a dark garbage bag and put them somewhere cool in the basement where again, where it's 45 or 50 degrees and leave them there till spring. Uh, you'll seal, seal the garbage bag up so it doesn't dry out. Uh, and then we'll leave him there till spring and then he'll come back out and we'll put him back out into the pond. Well, one of the questions I think my viewers would want to know is where do I find these unique plants? Uh, a lot of the garden centers now in the local area are carrying water plants. Uh, otherwise, they would have to probably do some mail order uh, and look for them online. Uh, there are many uh, water gardens, uh, especially out on the East Coast. Uh, I know Maryland has some in Florida. 
so they may have to do mail order. But I know a lot of the nurseries now, because water gardening has become a kind of a fun addition to the, the gardens uh, in people's yards. And so a lot of the nurseries, local nurseries, are starting to carry more water plants. And the same would probably be true in terms of fall. How long can we leave them out there? I mean, if they're predicting frost, right. it's too late. Actually, um, these plants uh, would have frozen normally, but I had pulled them out of the pond so they didn't freeze. Um, but typically, yes, yeah, these would have to come out before it freezes uh, because as you can even see with the cattails here in the pond, uh, the cool temperatures uh, already starting to take effect that they're going into a dormant uh, situation. And that's why you'll see some yellowing on this uh, dwarf papyrus already, that the cool temperatures are already telling it it's, it's not time to grow anymore, it's time to maybe shut down. And so yeah, these would have to come out before uh, we'd get any frost on them. So what is the first step you're going to do now to get this uh, water feature ready for winter? Well, what we'll do on this one being we have a circulating pump that's circulating the water uh, with the bile falls in the stream, I will shut the pump off and then I'll use another uh, same type of pump that uh, I will put it into the pond and plug it in and we'll actually start draining out the water uh, so it's enough that I can wade in with uh, knee-high boots and we'll start carrying out some of the water lilies. Okay, let's see it get in action. Okay, very good. What I'm going to do first is unplug the pump that we've got that's recirculating the water. Uh, it's right next to our pond here. All I have to do is unplug it. So our pump is shut off and our water is stopped. Well, it's still coming down the stream a little bit, but it will stop. And then the next thing I'll do is put in uh, the pump that I'm going to drain the water. Okay. I have that right close here. So I just step down in. So that's ready to go. And then I'll just end up plugging him in. And that will start our water draining down. And I uh, note that there are some fish in here. How many fish does a little pond like this support? We have about eight or nine larger fish in here from the range of about six to eight inches. And we, we just acquired three this summer that are probably about 12 to 14 inches long. Uh, they help keep the pond clean as well. Uh, these are koi. And what they do is they will kind of clean off the rocks if there's some algae uh, feeding, uh, growing on the rocks. Uh, so they'll, that's their purpose. We don't feed the fish here. Their purpose is to kind of help keep our pond clean as well. Uh, but the fish will have to come out for winter as well. And that'll be kind of one of our last steps that we would do uh, in this type of pond that we have fish in is, is to remove the fish at the end. I have a question. I'm looking to bring some great fall colors into my yard. What shrubs do you recommend? Well, the classic fall color plant is this Euonymus elatus, or burning bush as it's called. And uh, this gets spectacular fall color. It's a showstopper. Uh, sometimes we call these trees uh, traffic jam trees because people stop on the three mile drive here at, at the Arboretum and uh, uh, ooh and ah over it. So another uh, couple of plants that uh, come to mind as far as uh, fall color goes, uh, sumac, um, the aromatic sumac, the Rus aromatica or fragrant sumac has got really nice fall color as well as the typical staghorn uh, and the, uh, the uh, smooth sumac. Um, some other things that people really get excited about, um, I'm a little apprehensive about talking about it, but uh, amber maple uh, really does get nice fall color, I mean you just can't beat it. Um, we think it's somewhat invasive here, if not very invasive at the Arboretum, uh, but uh, people in other climates uh, west and north of the Twin Cities may not have as much problems with it. One plant that I'm highly touting right now for a substitute for Amar Maple is Acer Triflorum, or three-flowered maple. Um, it's a, another oriental species, but it doesn't have the invasive tendencies. Uh, it has beautiful uh, bark, it has nice fall color. 
Um, it's a small tree, similar to amber maple, but a, probably a little bit more uh, uh, refined and uh, compact. So those are just a few of the examples of what we kind of recommend for fall color. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Well, now that we've got the water down low enough that we can come in with just uh, knee-high boots, uh, our water's down so you can see the shelves. Uh, we have an upper shelf over here that our cattails will grow in. Eventually they'll start creeping down, uh, but our tropicals, this is where we usually put them is, is this outer shelf because they can only be in maybe two to three inches of water. Uh, then we step down a little bit. Uh, sometimes we can put some other type of uh, marginal plants there. Uh, and then we get into more of the, the bottom area where I'm standing is about two feet deep and that's where our water lily containers are at and that's where we'll start removing those. So I'm going to get at this first one here and my assistant Amanda here, once I get it lifted up to an area here, we'll kind of set it over here and once I get up there and making sure that we Bend our knees, and so lift with our knees. Do you want to step out, Amanda? And then we just set it down. And then what we do is we tip it on its side. So we get all the excess water out. And we'll just let it sit that way for maybe an hour or so. So we get all the excess water out of it. And then what we'll end up doing is pruning off the vegetation. And then we'll end up putting it in a black garbage bag and we'll store it for the winter. Is there anything unique about the pot? Hardy water lilies normally need to be in a container that's probably only six to eight inches deep by about 12 to 14 inches wide. And so this is actually a water lily container. It does not have any drainage holes because uh, Obviously, it's in water, so it doesn't. Uh, we don't have to have excess water draining out of it. Um, the soil that we use for the hardy water lilies, they like a really heavy soil, so a clay soil or clay loam soil. Um, we have some stones on the top here, some that fell out. The reason we put stones in on top of the soil is because koi and fish like to go in there and kind of muck around because they're in that carp family as such. And so the stones, by putting those in, uh, will help prevent the fish from uh, taking out some of our excess soil uh, around the, the water lily. So that's the reason we have the stones in there. So then we'll end up taking the stones out and uh, letting the water drain out, trim the vegetation off, and then we'll put it into the bag and then it'll go for winter storage. And we store these where um, just above freezing is ideal. Uh, where these are stored and where I store mine at home, it typically is about 50 degrees and with the garbage bag sealed up tight, uh, that way the moisture stays in there and the water lily is, is fine uh, to overwinter that way. Can it be too warm? Um, if it's too warm, yes, then your plant will probably start growing again in the, the container uh, inside the garbage bag. Now I've had them in spring where I've had leaves that they've already extended up like that, depending on how ambitious I am in the spring to uh, put them back out into my pond. Uh, it doesn't do any damage to the plant. Uh, it's fine and you can leave those leaves on when you put them back out in the spring again. They don't get sunburned? Um, usually not. Um, I haven't had a problem with them getting sunburned, but usually I'm putting mine out somewhere around April 1, April 15th, so the sun isn't really too powerful yet at that time of the year. Uh, if it does, you can just prune that vegetation off and because and, new leaves will sprout out. Uh, there's even been times where I've had uh, flower buds that are already poking up an inch or two. Uh, when I've taken the garbage bag off in the spring. And those will, as long as you don't break those off, uh, those will produce flowers right away in the, the spring then. So we're talking about the common water lily, not the tropical. Yes, this would be the, the hardy water lily. This is what we would do to, to uh, overwinter those. Uh, the tropical water lily, which uh, we have two of them in this pond here, uh, mainly we use tropical lilies because they will offer more flower colors uh, they come in purples and lavenders where we can't get those colors in hardy water lilies. So if people wanted to add some color, then they would probably add a tropical water lily. And tropical water lilies uh, can either bloom in the day or at night. 
Uh, there aren't any water lilies that will bloom day and night. Um, and hardy water lilies only bloom in the daytime, approximately from 10 in the morning to about 4 in the afternoon. Uh, with tropical water lilies, we can get night bloomers, and so they'll open up about 4 in the afternoon and stay open all night long until about 10 in the morning. So if you have uh, more of your free time is in the evenings, you might want to add a night blooming tropical water lily uh, to their collection. Uh, but we have to treat the tropical water lilies as basically an annual in the upper Midwest here. Uh, they're very difficult to overwinter. So basically what we do is we buy them as a plant in the spring. Uh, in the fall, uh, we just end up tossing it out. But it does add some variety, and especially in colors, uh, in, to the water pond. Uh, and you have such a beautiful blue or purple one there. Yes, we do. That one's called uh, Antares, I believe was the name of that one. And uh, again, it, you get those different colors. Where the hardy water lilies are basically whites, peaches, some oranges, uh, pinks, yellows, uh, some that are called reds, but as far as I know, there's not really a true red yet. They're, they're basically into that really, really deep pink uh, type of color. We have about uh, eight or ten different named varieties of hardy water lilies in this particular pond. Uh, we have a white and we have a couple variations in the yellows uh, as far as a light yellow and a deep yellow. We have one that's a deep pink, uh, Colorado, which is sort of a peachy kind of color that is a really a terrific bloomer, really a hardy type of, of water lily that blooms a lot. So we do have quite a bit of color in here as well, but in order to get those blues, we need to add some tropical water lilies. Okay, our container now is drained about an hour. So what we do is uh, we could cut the vegetation off at any time, but uh, what we need to do is get rid of all the uh, leaves and stems here. And I note you're cutting it right at the soil line. Yep, cutting it right there. If I see a little flower bud, sometimes I leave that <laughs> just in hopes that it will, it will not get broken over winter and it will come out next spring already and start flowering. But we pretty much take everything out. Now normally I wear rubber gloves when I do this because mm -hmm. uh, I end up doing a lot of them. And because this is in the anaerobic conditions, it does smell a little bit. But I'll end up taking our stones out so that it's not so heavy when we uh, end up carrying him to wherever he's going. Now mine go in my basement. Uh, here at the station, we're able to put them in the north end of our dairy barn where it stays uh, about 45, 50 degrees. So pretty much our vegetation is removed here. And I can see now on this particular water lily, this is the whole tuber or rhizome. And what it does is a water lily grows from one point and it will grow all the way across the container or the pot. And so our main growing point is at this end of this water lily. And there's another one coming off the side and it's starting to come up over the lip of the container. That indicates to me that this water lily is time to repot it. I'll leave it this way for winter, um, but next spring what we'll do is we'll end up taking this out of the container, washing all the soil off of it, and I'll end up just cutting uh, a little bit of the rhizome here left where the growing point is. That's all I need, and I'll repot that again, putting it on the far side where the growing point then will grow all the way across the container again so it's good for another two, three years or so before it has to be uh, repotted again. So this old rhizome will be discarded? Yep, that's all discarded as it's kind of almost, looks like it's already starting to kind of deteriorate and rot away. So now we've got it all drained out, we've got our vegetation off. What I end up doing then is, is putting it into this garbage bag. And we'll pull it up around it. Try not to uh, tearing any holes into the bag and we get it enough so that I can gather it together and getting our air out, twist it around and then I usually just use masking tape and put that around the, the twisted part here. Well, I thought you were supposed to use duct tape. Uh, we've used duct tape, <laughs> uh, but uh, this works well for me. And then what I do is I end up usually writing, putting a piece of masking tape on the side here, mm -hmm. and I put what the name of the water lily is. 
Uh, that way I can keep track from year to year which ones we have. Does that require a special soil mixture? I mean, can you buy that as a pre-packaged product? There or? are uh, water uh, plant soils that are pre-mixed for you. Um, you do not want to buy a type of soil mix that has uh, peat moss or perlite or vermiculite in it because that will float out of the uh, soil and end up just kind of floating around in your pond and kind of making it messy. So it, it is a special soil, but you could dig, uh, if, you, if you know you have a clay loam soil uh, where you live, uh, you could just dig it up and use that as a uh, soil medium, or you can purchase, uh, like I say, there is mixtures that are already uh, made up for water plants. Well, Bernie, I noticed we still have quite a few fish in this pond. What's the procedure there? Obviously, they have to come out of the pond because the pond's going to freeze up and we're going to drain it dry. What we do is we move them into a tank, into an unheated building. Uh, it's about a 100-gallon tank. We have an aerator, aquarium aerator in there, so it keeps oxygen in there, and it helps purify the water. Uh, we keep them at about 45 degrees. We put in a, a tank um, de-icer, so it keeps the temperature around 45 degrees. So if I'm storing these fish over winter, do I got to feed them every couple days or? If they're stored at uh, 45 or 50 degrees, your water temperature, um, they do not need feed because if they actually ate food, uh, they couldn't digest it and they would actually die from it. So these don't get a bit of food all winter long. Um, we don't have light on them either. It's just in a dark storage area, just with the aerator. We do take out 10% uh, of the water once a week and put in fresh water. So that's all we have to do. Okay. Well, that's rather simple. It can be, yes. Well, Bernie, it looks like you got a lot of work to still complete the process, and I want to let you get to it. Okay. But I want to thank you for uh, being so informative and helping me understand the care that needs to be taken in the fall for a water feature. It's been my pleasure, Larry. Anytime. Closed captioning is provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill Farm. Shalomhill.org.